in power. The goodness is in you. Believe in the Lord. God has given you a unique fruit. Nobody can copy you. You are never going to lose your salvation. Ever. He is faithful to answer every prayer. All right, let's go to the word of God, the gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. We are looking at the subject, the believer and the supernatural. We are talking about receiving the anointing. We talked about various aspects to receive the anointing. What's the first one? Ask, seek, and knock. Desire, diligence, and determination. Okay, enables us to receive the anointing. Second, we talked about thirst, and now it enables us to receive the anointing, right? <clears throat> Thirdly, this is what we are talking about. What do we talk about thirdly? Prayer. Very good. Fourthly, the Word of God. All right? When we study the Word of God, when we go deeper into the Word of God, we step into the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit does not work without the Word. I showed you from Genesis how that whenever the Word was proclaimed, the Spirit of God was able to move. So whenever the Word is declared, the anointing will show up and there will be a great demonstration of healing, deliverance, and so on. So the word is required. The fifth and the last requirement that we are talking about is consecration. Consecration is the fundamental requirement. It is because of its pivotal importance that without consecration, we cannot really do the work of the Lord effectively. Am I right about that? What does consecration mean? A simple definition of consecration is pulling away from to cling to pulling away from the world to cling to the lord it's moving away setting a set time separating from the daily affairs and the daily chores of life the daily works of life setting a daily you know time with the lord where you are away from all that demands your time your effort your energy and stepping into the presence of god and just receiving and being blessed with his presence right we talked about that and under that we began to talk about from the life and the journey of Mary, you know, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, the five P's of consecration. What's the first P? Pursuit, right? She pursued God. And that's what we see in this gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Two things she did, sat at his feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted like many of us with much stirring, much work, much technology, much computer, much banking, much this, much that. We are caught up and distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her, to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. That's the problem. When we have many things, trouble will come. Worries will come. But verse 42 says, but one thing, there's the contrast. There's the comparison. If you have many things, you're worried to death. If you have one thing, you're blessed. One thing. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will be, never be taken away from her. So when you pursue God, you begin to experience the presence of God. Now, when you pursue the presence of God, the second P that happens is purity. Right? You cannot pursue God's presence and not be affected by His purity. Anytime you get into the presence of God, His purity begins to rub off on you. You begin to understand that you are now beginning to be freed from, you know, struggles with thoughts, with words and deeds that are sinful, that are carnal, that are fleshly, and you begin to experience the purity of God. Now, when you are in pursuit and you receive the purity of God, the next thing that God gives you is power. The third P in Mary's life is power. And we talked about it a little bit, and we... We stopped at, you know, this fact. In order to have power, you must be with God. In order to have power, you must be with God. That's, that's very, very important, church. In order to have power, you must be with God. Now, I'm not talking about activity where you do some things for the Lord like 
lifting your hands and clapping your hands, dancing or singing. No, I'm talking about quality time with the Lord. Listen, there is no power without pursuit. There is no power without purity. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see what? God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, you're not going to see God face to face. You're going to see his demonstrative uh, power. You're going to see his glory. You're going to see and hear him. That's what it means. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see him so alive and active and ablaze in that life. When you are walking in purity, God empowers you he gives you the power and when you start understanding that the more you draw closer to him the more you give quality time to God the more you will walk in power I'm telling you we need the power like never before as we are facing you know we are in the last days and the prophet Joel said in the last days God will pour his spirit on all flesh Irrespective of who you are, what color you are, what gender you are, if you have flesh, you're entitled to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God said, I'll pour my spirit on all flesh. He didn't say white flesh. He didn't say black flesh. He didn't say brown flesh. He didn't say yellow flesh. He said, I'll pour my spirit on? Uh-huh, uh-huh. On all flesh. That's what you got to understand. God will pour his spirit on all flesh. So we must give quality time to the Lord. Spend time with him. Now you may ask the Lord, what can I bring to you? What kind of a song would you like me to sing? Lord, what can I do for you? God's response is, I don't want you to do a thing. That's what God's response is. You don't have to do a thing. Simply be a little longer with me. All other works can wait. Just be a little longer with me. Please let that statement register. The sovereign God who has multiple millions of angels to attend him. The seraphims and the cherubims who are, you know, guardians of his holiness. They are there to attend on him. The saints of bygone days, the old and the new testament who are already in glory. God has enough people to attend on him, to worship him, to glorify me as millions, billions of angels to worship and glorify him. But listen, he says, I don't want you to give me your songs. I don't want you to give me lifting your hand, clapping your hands. I don't want you to give me your money. He says, can you give me a little more time? What a God. I want a little more of your time. Will you be a little, a little longer with me? That's relationship. And when I, when, I was, when I was receiving this word, it broke me down. It broke me that I would have a God that will, that will, well, that will choke and say, I want a little more time from you. All other things can wait. Just be with me a little longer. Just be with me a little longer. I remember the time when my brother had passed away. My, my second brother had passed away. And he had been on the, on the street. He had fallen on the road and died. And, you know, they, when he was dying and he was pleading for water, nobody gave him even a cup of cold water. And he died on the road. And seven, seven hours later, somebody realized who he was and brought him in at that time every i was here you know doing the ministry everything in me died and i said I, i'll be a believer but i can't be a preacher anymore i can't be a preacher anymore this is too much to handle because just two years previous to that i lost my eldest brother and now my second eldest and everything in me said I'll be a believer. I'll, I'll, I'll continue to serve you, uh, serve you as a believer, but I can't preach anymore. And that's what I made up my mind. And I was standing, you know, at, at the funeral. And I was, I was across. And as I started to cross the street to come into the house, I had gone from here. At that moment when I went, the Lord spoke to me. You know, when you're choked, right? When your voice starts to crack because of 
sorrow or pain. And the Lord in that cracked, choked tone said, Son, will you leave me? Will you leave the ministry? And I stopped right in the middle of that street and, and sobbed like a baby to think that a sovereign God who can get at, at, at the twinkling of his eye multiple millions who will fill my place who are more qualified than me would stop and say in that choked tone, would you leave me? Would you stop doing my ministry? I broke down my pastor, my senior pastor, thinking that I was, you know, breaking down because of the pain of my brother's separation. Rushed to my aid and he said, you are a pastor. You have to consult the rest of the families. Colin, why are you breaking down like this? I said, pastor, I'm not breaking down for what I'm seeing. I'm breaking down for what I heard. And I told him and he was shocked. He said, you should not be thinking like that. I said, but I was. From that day, I pledge no matter what happens in my life, I will do the ministry till my last breath. Don't ever you plead like this again, God. You, you are sovereign. That day, I learned a lesson. He is not a sovereign God alone to me. He is my father. And just like if my daughter stops speaking to me or says I'm walking out of the house, I'll break down because of relationship. I began to understand how much must he love me. He doesn't want me to do the ministry. Listen, he's, he's got millions to do the ministry. He says, are you, are you going to deprive me of the time you are giving me? Let me tell you, when I came back, I doubled my time. And when I came back, I doubled my commitment. And God gave the increase. And God gave the increase. Until then, there was just 15 members in the church. But all of a sudden, it started coming and it started coming and they are still coming. And it, they'll continue to come. And the nations of the world will hear this gospel. Because I came to understand that there is a God that says, can you be with me a little longer? Church, do you realize what I'm talking to you? I'm talking to you from experience. I'm not talking from my head. I'm not talking from intelligent, uh, uh, an intelligent point of view. I'm not talking from information. I'm talking from an experience where God says, would you leave me? And I said, no, Lord, never, never will. Whatever I lose in life, I'd rather lose anything, but I'm not giving up serving you. I'm not giving up preaching the gospel until death happens. I will keep preaching. Alone or not, I'll keep preaching. In relationship or not with the world, I'll keep preaching. And I tell you, my friend, this 30 years has been a breakthrough because God is a faithful God. But he wants to know, will you give him a little more time? He says, I don't want your songs. I don't want your music. I don't want your talents. I don't want your gift. I don't want even your money, but I want you. I want you. What do you want me to give you, Lord? He says, I want you to be with me a little longer. Will you? I want you to be. I want you to get the heartbeat of the Savior right now. I'm not trying to make you emotional. That's not my aim. Emotions don't last. I'm trying to stir you to a decision, not to an emotion. I'm not, I'm not stirring you to remorse. I'm stirring you to repentance. Remorse is it cries and then goes back and suicides like Judas. Judas had remorse but no repentance. Peter had repentance. Peter became the greatest of the initial apostles. We need, we need more than remorse. We need more than just feeling sorry for yourself or feeling sorry and, and crying out and saying, God, I'm sorry. We need more than that. We need a turnaround. God does not want remorse. He wants repentance. No use feeling sorry for what you did. Turn around. Say, no, I'm not coming back that way, devil. Bye to you and your filth. I am on my way to a highway of holiness. I have nothing to do with this world. Holiness. Because I'm in the presence of God. But the problem is because most of us are religious. So sin conscious. So mistake conscious. So time conscious. That the biblical fact that God delights in us is something we cannot understand. But I came to tell you today, God delights in you. God delights in you if you spend more time in his presence you will understand the heart of the father i'm telling you my brothers and sisters you cannot have a good relationship without quality time together ask any husband and wife that 
they'll tell you if they don't have a quality time together that marriage is not going to be a testimony but the more they are together the more they begin to see how they are each other's delight am i right or no the more you are in relationship with someone, the more you begin to see how much that person delights in you and how much you delight in that person. You got to know that when you pursue God, God begins to release his power on you. Write this down, please. Power is the ability to change situations. Power is the ability to change situations. Write this also down. The result of power is change. Anytime you see God show up in power, there is always a change in the surrounding. There is always a change of circumstance. There's always a change in the, in the life that you are living, in the lives of those around you. Wherever God showed up, as we heard the testimonies shared, it was when God showed up through his word, there was change. Change in body health, change in the situation, a change of lifestyle. Whenever God shows up in power, he brings about a change. The reason you and I are here today is because God changed us. One time we were in the wrong places. We were all in the sinful joint. We were lost and heading to hell. But God showed up in your, in your life and there was a release of power. And from sinner to saint, you have been changed. And now you're walking the talk and living the walk. And now you're a blessing to multitudes. Why? Because there's power. The power of change. Have you experienced the power of God to change? Number one, number one, power is the ability to change the impossible to possible. Not impossible, the impossible, that which you cannot pass through or pass over. Power is the ability to change the impossible to possible. You got it? Too many of us are trying to pass through things, but we are unable we are standing in, in certain situations where we cannot pass through or pass over. We are in a, in, a, in a state of being cornered and we want to throw in the towel. But God has got good news for you that if you have been consecrated, if you have spent time in the presence of God and whenever the enemy tries to corner you, God will release his power that will make a way where there is no way. God help me. Exodus chapter 14, please. Exodus chapter 14, verse 15 and 16. Let me give you the background. God had supernaturally brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And now they're on their exodus, on their exit from slavery to the promised land. From a land of bondage to a land flowing with milk and honey. From a land of poverty to a land of prosperity. From a land of brokenness to a land of wholeness. From a land of emptiness to a land of fullness. From a land where they were mediocre to a land of excellence. God is calling the church to a lifestyle of excellence. Look at your neighbor and say, excellence is waiting on you. Oh, shut up. Yeah, the, the excellence of God is waiting on you. And when they started to get out, the Bible says they started rejoicing because of the power with which God brought them out. The Bible says with a mighty outstretched hand, he brought them out. Power was on display. But the same power that brought them out is the same power that led them right to the Red Sea. And when they came right before the Red Sea and they saw that, Pharaoh was pursuing them. They were cornered. They couldn't go forward. There was the Red Sea. They couldn't go to the left or to the right because there was mountainous terrain which they could not cross over with their caravans and their wagons and their women and their children and old men. They couldn't cross those rocky mountains. They were cornered. They couldn't go ahead. They couldn't go behind. Pharaoh was coming. They couldn't go to any other side because it was impossible. They could not pass. And the Bible says they were filled with anger, regret, and fear. Whenever we come to a cul-de-sac, whenever we come to a place where there's a dead end, where we are cornered, we almost, you know, do the same thing. We get 
you know, fearful, we get worried, we panic, and we begin to speak negative. And that's exactly what they did. They began to curse Moses and they said, didn't we not tell you, leave us alone? You brought us, yeah, because there was not enough graves in Egypt. How quick do people forget the miracles that they just saw? They had just witnessed 10 astonishing miracles that laid the gods of Egypt to rest. God just demonstrated who is boss. And after seeing a demonstration and a display of such power, how do you so quick turn back and start, you know, talking like you did? But let me tell you, before we judge Israel, most of us do the same thing. We have experienced miracles. How many of you have experienced miracles in the past? Right? See how many of you have experienced miracles? And yet sometimes when a new challenge arises, we, we come to that place of asking God, God, can you handle this? I know you did all these things in the Bible, but this is bigger than the, all the other ones. Lord, can you handle this? God, I think this is too big for you. I, I don't think, Lord, you, you can do anything in this situation. That's what we do. That's what they did. They, they, they were so negative that even, even Moses was touched by it. Moses, who was calm and confident, also got shaken up. And verse 15, you know, says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Moses started crying out and saying, God, what have you done to us? See, he got in. I'm telling you, negativism is contagious. I'm telling you, you'll be 15 minutes around a negative person, and for the next whole, you know, day, the balance of those hours that you spend, you will walk around becoming negative. Just sit with a negative person for 15 minutes. And you'll say, oh, yes, how bad this day is. Well, oh, it's hot. It's bad. It doesn't look good. I mean, you, I mean, all your whole facial experience changes. Why? Because you've been with negative. Negativism is contagious. And so Moses was affected by it as well. And he, and he cries out to the Lord. And the Lord says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Write this down, please. Write this principle down. Go forward. Everybody say, go forward. Look at your neighbor and say, go forward. There it is again. Our new year theme. Looking back. Going forward. Moving forward. That's our new year. That's this whole year's teaching, right? Over and over again, God has brought us to this fact that we are moving forward. AFT is moving forward. The body of Christ is moving forward. Every Christian organization is moving forward. It doesn't matter how difficult the devil makes the world for us. But I'm telling you, no matter what the devil does, the church is an advancing church. It may not look like it now. She may not be dressed like she should be. She may not be having a wedding gown. But let me tell you, she's still the bride of Christ. Soiled, but she's still the bride of Christ. Dirty, but she's still the bride of Christ. Struggling, but she's still the bride of Christ. Oh, come on, talk to me, somebody. She is not what she should be, but she is still the bride of Christ. And Christ has not abandoned her. In fact, he's empowering her. He's clothing her with his purity and power. And I'm telling you, the church is an advancing church. Look at your neighbor and say, we are progressing. Amen. We are an advancing church <laughs> The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Why? Because the church is a moving church. We are going forward. Everybody say, I am going forward. Oh, you got to say it like the devil hears it. I am going forward. I don't care what the statistics say. I am going forward. Mm -hmm. I don't care what the tableau says. I am going forward. I don't care what the expert says. I am going forward. I don't care what the ratio says. I am going forward. I don't care if all the church benches are filled. But I am going forward. I may not have the money. But I am going forward. I may not have the qualification. But I am going forward. My qualification is Jesus. My academical excellence is Jesus. My wisdom is he. My knowledge is he. My understanding is me. My power is he. My breath is he. My throb is he. My heartbeat is he. Jesus is my everything. And as long as Jesus is my everything, I am going forward. Why are you crying to me? Tell them to go forward. I brought you to go forward. Write this principle down. Never allow obstacles or fear 
Never allow obstacles of fear to blind you of the power, potential, and possibilities that rest only in God. Oh, God. Yeah. Never allow obstacles of fear to blind you of the power, potential, and possibilities that rest only in your God. The problem with us is we evaluate our God on the basis of what we go through. But it's time to change ties and evaluate the circumstances because of the God we serve. Stop evaluating your God based on your circumstances and start evaluating your circumstances based on your God. That means you got to say to everything that is standing in your way, listen, you cannot make me blind to the power and the potential and the possibilities that are resident in my God for he can do anything at any time for anyone in any place. Don't allow circumstances, obstacles, fear, worry to blind you to the power, potential, and possibilities that rest only in your God. Just when you come to the end of all your possibilities, you know what? He is full of new and exciting possibilities. When you think you've hit the road and you've come to the end, but let me tell you this, when you reach the end of your road, you're just beginning his road. And I want you to come to the end of your road. I want you to come to the end of yourself. I want you to, the, to come to the end of your resources. I want, you to the, I want you to come to the end of everything that you are and stand for. Because when you come to the end of yourself, you will step into the beginning of your God. Until you can say, I cannot. Only then can he say, I can. But as long as you say, I can, he'll say, okay, try. And he'll wait on you until you come to your God and say, Father, I give up. I can't do it. And he says, now step aside. Daddy will show you how to do business. Step aside and let daddy show you how. Oh, I wish I had a witness in the house. Verse 16, Exodus 14, verse 16. But lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Oh my. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Lift up your rod, stretch out your hand. All the time we want God to do what he told us to do. It's convenience when God does everything, isn't it? God, why don't you heal the sick? Lord, why don't you do this? Lord, no, he said, you do it. He says, I gave you the power. He says, Moses, why are you crying to me? I put my power in your rod. He says, lift your rod and stretch your hand. Look at your neighbor and say, use what he gave you. Look them in the eye and say, you better use what he gave you. Don't simply cry out and say, God, what am I to do in this? He says, you know, lift up your rod and stretch out your hand you, you you do your stuff you 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 use your rod god will always use what you already have that's one key you know truth about the anointing god will always use what you have god never asks you to do something that he has not equipped you to do he says lift up your rod stretch out your hand and divide the sea who's going to do the dividing See, you're not sure yourself. Come on, tell me, who's going to do the dividing? No, you didn't read it properly. Let me read it again. Okay, you read it. You read it. But lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and who's going to do the dividing now? See, this is the problem because we have a wrong perspective. The power is God's, but the work is yours. The power is God, but you have to do the healing. You're the instrument. You're the channel. He says, lift up your rod, stretch out your hand, and you divide the sea. That's what is the implication. Don't ask me. Don't call on me. I gave you the power. 
I gave you the power when you met me. I gave you what you needed to bring the people out. And you used it so long, so well. Now why have you forgotten to use your rod? You used it against Pharaoh. You used it against his gods. You used it against his economy. You used it against your circumstances. Now why did you forget it? Don't forget what your God gave you. Write this down. God can turn, God can turn a no way into a highway. Your God can turn a no way into a highway. If your God is able to lead you to it, your God is able to lead you beyond it. Come on, talk to me somebody. If your God can bring you to the Red Sea, he can take you through the Red Sea. If he's got to fly you in a limousine across it, he'll do it. Don't you ever confine God to your methodologies. Your God is beyond your methods. Whenever you approach God, be open please. Because you cannot box God. God has multiple million of ways to reach you. And to fetch you across to your destiny. If he said you're going to Canaan land, you're going to Canaan land. Doesn't matter who is behind you. Doesn't matter who is before you. Doesn't matter what's on the either side of you. If he said Canaan is your destiny, Canaan is where I'm going. But what about the Red Sea? I don't know. He said Canaan, that's all I know. Canaan is my destiny point. How are you going to get that? I don't know. You better know, man. You got, you got to have some kind of knowledge to know where you're going. No. My God doesn't give me details. He doesn't give you what he's going to do tomorrow or today. Because you can't handle it. Our finite minds will not handle it. They came to the Red Sea and said, now what? Now what now? All this for what? God says, shut up. You don't even know how to believe. I'm, say, I'm saying to you, if I brought you to it, I can take you through it. Oh God. God can turn turn a no way into a highway verse 21 then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided verse 22 so the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left I wonder how many of you would have taken that journey even though God had split it apart. Let's be honest. How many of you would have really taken that journey, church? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you, 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 I mean, even though it stands like a wall, but it's still water. You can still see this is not a concrete wall. You can, oh yeah, oh yeah, I know it's a miracle, but how long? I mean... <laughs> Uh, how long is it going to stand? Uh, oh God, oh, dear, oh hallelujah, hallelujah. And the moment the wind starts blowing and it starts, you know what water days? You know what a sea days when there's a violent wind? I'm telling you, the devil must have been blowing that, that, that sheet of water around. And they, every time it, it moved a little bit, they said, wall. Oh, come on, let's be, let's be real. Don't think it was a magical day. Just walked in, you know, and walked out, you know, and everything was, I'm telling you, I am... I am, I, I am imagining that quite often they would have put their hands to check if it's still. I don't know, but I, I, I believe. I, I, I think it. I think it. They would have been testing it along the way to see whether it's, it's, it's strong enough to keep up. How many of us, before we sit, we check the chair we sit on? Come on, let's be real. We never ponder on these things. It's not a cake. It's not a cakewalk, my friend. I mean, it's easy for us to sit now, you know, several thousands years later and, and look back and laugh at the incident. But if you were one of those folks walking through that, that, that great sea, I'm telling you, you must have had butterflies in your hearts. It must have been going para 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 And sometimes if when the wave, you know, start, when, when that wall started to, you know, just move a little bit. Yeah. It's Hallelujah. The songs come out so quickly then. When anything is moving around, oh my God, yes, Jesus, I love you. 
I love you, Lord. Remember me. I'm just, I got to go. I got still two, to two and a half days to go. Lord, hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hallelujah. Hold it, Lord. Whenever you cross through watery walls, remember this. The only concrete in the liquid is the word of your God. The only concrete in your liquid, in your liquidity, is his power. He has the power to change the impossible to passable. A little while ago, they said, how are we going to get across? Now, they're walking and, they're, and dragging their caravans and dragging their women and, and the children. Say, come fast, lady. What's wrong with you? We've got to get before this wall gives in. But remember this. If your God starts you on a journey, he'll complete it. Being confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you, he'll bring it to perfection till the coming of Jesus Christ. Your God started this work of salvation. You didn't get saved. He saved you. You didn't find him. He found you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. Talk to me somebody. Power to change the impossible to possible. Joshua chapter 3 is another incident. Joshua chapter 3 verse 15. And I'm going to read it from the NLT for, for you know, clarity. Bear with me for reading it. It will, it will be in the NKJV on your screen, your TV screen. But I'm going to read from the NLT. Just follow me and then we can look at our screens. Joshua 3.15. You're in Joshua? All right. Verse 15. It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge. It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing in banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests uh, who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river edge. Now there's, there's a couple of things I want you to notice. Number one, there's the ark. All right? The ark. And number two, the priests who carry the ark. All right? Who are eligible? Now, now what does the ark signify? The ark in the Old Testament is a symbol of God's presence. The ark is a symbol of God's presence. And who are the ones to carry the presence? Priests. Why? Because they were consecrated. So we are coming back to consecration. Only those who are consecrated carry the power. Not everybody. Only those who every day set a time for God with God are the ones eligible to carry his power to the next dimension. If you die, you may go to heaven because you're saved. But if that's all you did and did nothing more and did not spend time with God, you cannot carry the power. You cannot carry the presence of God like you would want to. The priests who carried the ark, the ones who were consecrated, set apart, you know, sanctified, pulled out from the world, pulled out from their daily, you know, activities, pulled out from the profession. They who have been pulled out from in order to cling to the presence of God. They are the ones eligible to carry the ark. And they carried it. And the Bible says, as soon as the feet, the lowest part of their body, touched the overflowing river. Listen, the ark was the Old Testament equivalent to Emmanuel God with us. Are you getting what I'm saying? The ark was the Old Testament equivalent to Emmanuel, God with us. In other words, when this ark was on the way, when this ark led the way, what is it explaining to us? Because God told, Mo, uh, told Joshua, tell the people to follow, uh, you know, 2,000 meters behind. Tell them to stay at a distance and follow the ark. Why? Why do they have to follow the ark? Because God will always be out in front leading you. When he is leading you, you cannot fail. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Whenever you see the ark going in front of you, it is, a, it is a message to you that God always leads from the front. 
That's the reason why I preach this gospel with such passion and with such, you know, uh, uh, emotional gusto. Why? Because I know whom I have believed. Oh, come on. I, I, I don't come here with my head. I come here with my heart. I know what I've, I'm talking about. I've experienced him. And I declare to you today that whenever you trust this God, he is out there in the flood. He leads by example. Amen. In other words, he would be the first one to take the first steps towards Canaan. Isn't it good that when you have God going out in front, you'll end up in Canaan? Your task and my task, church, is like the task of the Israelites. Just follow the ark. Touch your neighbor and say, whatever you do, just follow the ark. Just follow the ark. Just keep your eyes on that box. <laughs> Just keep your eyes on the God who is leading you. In other words, what am I saying? I am saying pursue his presence. There we are back to the subject. Pursue his presence like Mary did. Go after him. Because when you go after him, you will end up in your destiny. Amen. Verse 16. When the feet of the priest touched the water. Verse 16. I'm still reading from the NL NLT. The water above that point began backing up. At a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarathan. And the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. Then all the people crossed over near to the town of Jericho. I want to bring your attention in that verse. The water about that point began backing up a great distance. Whenever the priests who are consecrated set apart their life to God. Step forward. Whenever you start going forward, everything that was opposing you starts backing away a great distance. Come on, look at that, my friend. You got to see your God. Whenever your God starts to go before you, I'm telling you, everything that was challenging you, everything that was overflowing, everything that was flooding, everything that was intimidating, everything that was threatening is now backing off because they never expected this they thought you were alone when the river stood there it said you're alone you are three million people but you're still alone you are farmers who don't know to fight but they forgot that the God who brought them out as farmers is the God who can be their fighter they don't need to fight they can be farmers but they don't need to fight all they got to do is sow the seed of God's word and God will fight for them you put farmers against fighters, but if God is in their life, farmers will win. But they will win without an instrument. They will win without a weapon. Talk to me somebody. But the Bible says, when the feet of the priest touched, they didn't even go too much, they just touched the waters. Touch your neighbor and say, all you got to do is touch the water. <laughs> touch the water. That means... The Bible says uh, the Christian life is a walk of faith. Walk of faith. When you look at the waters, it looks threatening. It's overflowing. It's flooding. It's harvest time. We can't cross over. It's impossible. But I, I don't know what will happen. But he said, put my feet in. I, I don't know whether it will part or not. But he said, put my foot in. The moment you take that first step of faith in your walk with God. I'm telling you, everything will start backing up. Tell your neighbor it's going to back up. Yeah, he's going to back up a great distance. That's why I like this translation. It says, and the water that stood about started backing up way back. It started going real back. It started going, I mean, I'm telling you, it started retreating. The problem with the church is, as long as we stay where we are, the enemy will march towards you. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, don't turn to it, but just listen. The Bible says, the champion of God, Goliath. The Bible says, the first time he came out and challenged the people of Israel. And they did nothing. The first thing it says, he came out. Then it says, he came near. Number one, he came out and they did nothing to challenge him. Then he came near. And still they did nothing. And the moment he came near, they started going backwards. Saul and all the warriors of Israel started hiding from this giant, from this hulk of, you know, human flesh. He was a monster to look at. 
And when he came near and found that they were retreating, the Bible says the third thing is he started coming up. He came out. He came near, now he's coming up. Anytime you don't move against the enemy, he'll come up on you. I, did you hear what I said? He'll come up on you. He'll come up right up to your nose and take you out. Uh, he'll take your kids. He'll take your wife. He'll take your children. He'll take your job. He'll take your finances. He'll take everything from you. Don't wait for the enemy to come. You go out to him. When Goliath saw everybody retreating, he said, this is, this is easy pickings. This is chicken feed for me. These guys are chickens. Until he met a giant. He saw a giant in a tiny frame of a 13 to a 15 year old. He saw a giant. He saw a king in a kid. And the, and the kid spoke big. And he says, uh, listen, I've heard this before. Whenever you chatter, I know that you don't have stuff. People who talk too much. The only reason they talk too much is because they don't have anything to back it up. But the mistake he made was to underestimate that this little kid was just like the others. Having a big talk, but little action. But the Bible says, when Goliath said, I'll feed you to, the, to my gods. The Bible says, David ran towards the giant. That's where the power is. Your faith is not saying, you know, I believe, thank you, Lord, I'm healed, this, that, that. You know, no, 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 no. When you start talking, start moving as well. Come on, somebody. Don't just sit there and say, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, and still stay there in the bed for three days. Get up and walk. Get up and walk. Show your faith in action. Faith without works is dead. So, so God told Joshua, tell them to put their feet in. And when the Bible says he put his foot in, the thing started going way back, way back, a great distance. All right? Verse 16 of the NKJV. Then the waters which came down from upstream stood still. Everything that was coming down on you will stand still. Are you getting it? Everything that's coming down from the upstream, from the powers of the principal powers of the air everything that's coming from above i'm telling you get ready my friend when it's coming down and you start moving towards it it will stand still it's time to let the powers of the air know you're not intimidated by it it's time to let the powers of the air know you can come down but you have to stand still at a particular point when will that which is coming from above stand still when you make progress when you go forward somebody scream go forward if you don't put your foot in the water, you won't make it. But you won't put your foot in the water if you have not been consecrated. It's the set apart people that will take you into your destiny. It was the priests, the consecrated ones who carried the pursuit and who carried the presence and who carried the purity of God. They had the power of God. And when they stepped into the, into the river, the Bible says that the waters that came from up stood still and the waters that were at the back went down into the Dead Sea so that nothing came where they were. Why? Because your God is in control. Now watch this. Verse 17, NLT, New Living Translation. Meanwhile, while the waters were running and fleeing, meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. What was impossible is now possible by the power of God. They waited there. Who? The priests waited right in the middle, standing firm until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Let me tell you, God is ushering the priests. Let me tell you today. In that day, they were a set apart people. But today, every believer is a priest. I said, every believer is a priest. I said, every believer is a priest. I said, every believer is a priest. Are you a believer? Then you are a priest. If you're a priest, you have to have consecration. If you're a priest, you got to carry the ark of God's presence. If you're a priest, you got to make the walk. Don't just talk the talk. You got to make the walk. You got to live the life. It's easy to talk the talk, 
But it's a challenge to walk the walk. But when you take that first step, I'm telling you, the, the, the water starts to go back. What's the indication? What's the clue? Continue going forward. They went right till they came in the middle. And then God said, now you stand here. God will always make you stand firm in the middle of your affliction. God has a sense of humor. He will not let you stand at the, at the starting point. He will move you right up till the middle. Because he says, whenever you are in the middle of things, that's when you need to be rock solid. I lost you. I lost some of you today. It's easy, my friend. It's, it's really easy to, 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 to say hallelujah at the start. But the deeper you go, the more deeper it is. It's easy to stand at the bank of the river because it's just three feet. But now you go to the middle, it's about 12 to 16 feet. Uh -uh. That's where the problem is. You can stand in three feet even if you can't swim. Because you'll not drown in three feet water. You will not drown in three feet water. But the deeper you go, the current is stronger. And we do not know what is underneath. History says, oh, I'm talking about not church history. I'm talking about, you know, history says there was underground rushes and, and bull rushes and all that, you know, underground, uh, you know, plants that will pull you, suck you in and kill you. And the Bible says they went right into the middle of all that stuff and stood their ground until everybody passed on dry ground. Let me tell you, God will make you pass without wet feet. That's when you know God has been in that area. When you can walk through wet waters with dry feet. That's the signature of God. That you can walk through wet areas with dry feet. It's impossible naturally. But it's possible supernaturally. You can walk through dry places and have your feet wet. All the other area is, is dry. But Gideon's fleece alone is wet. You have a God who can wet you when everything else is dry. And dry you when everything else is wet. But I'm asking you the question today. Do you have the feet to walk? Do you have the feet to walk and stand in the middle? The Bible says you ought to stand firm. I like the way it puts it in the NKJV. Verse 17 in the NKJV says, Then the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm. Everybody say, I'm standing firm. Oh, come on, say it again. I'm standing firm. Aha, 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 aha. I'm standing firm right in the middle. Right in the middle of a malady, I'm standing firm. Right in the middle of a mess, I'm standing firm. Right in the middle of confusion, I'm standing firm. Like, right in the middle of mediocrity, I'm standing firm. Right in the middle of a mess, I'm standing firm. Right in the middle of tragedy, I'm standing firm. Right in the middle of traumatic experiences, I'm standing firm. You can't knock me out. You may knock me down, but you can't knock me out. Because God has strengthened my feet like the feet of a hind. I tell you, I got dear's feet. I tell you, you can put me anywhere. I'll stand firm because my standing is not on my ability. I stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set me free. I'm standing in the rock of my salvation. I'm standing on the solid rock. All of the ground is sinking sand, but Christ is my solid rock. I'm set upon the rock. And the matter, no matter how much the flood comes, no matter how much the wind blows, no matter how much the rain beats upon the house, my house will not be knocked down because I'm built on the solid rock. I'm standing on the rock you can try what you want you can blow you can howl you can heart you can knock but you cannot make me out uh, let me tell you today i don't care how, how much the winds are blowing i don't care what the cyclonic you know storm you know results are i don't care what the re weather report says i don't care how much the waters are climbing it might be climbing up and going past the danger levels but i came to tell you today when it reaches your house it's not going to touch you you know why because you're founded on the rock uh, my feet is standing firm in the midst of everything that looks hopeless I'm standing firm in the midst of all tragedies I'm standing firm in the midst of conflict I'm standing firm in the midst of a war I'm standing firm in the midst of everything that's threatening me to go down I will stand firm because I'm on the rock I'm on the rock I'm on the rock that's the power of your God that's the power of your God the ability to change the impossible to possible but secondly secondly power is the ability to change the unchangeable power 
is the ability to change the unchangeable. Let me quickly say this and then we'll close. Second Kings chapter 2 verse 19 to 22. Second Kings chapter 2 verse 19 to 22. You can look up at the screen if you can't find where Second Kings is. Go home and find it. But for now, look up at the screen. Then the man of the city said to Elisha, Please notice, may we bring to your attention, the situation of the city is pleasant as my Lord sees. But all that, that you see may not be as well as it is. All that glitters is not gold. The city is pleasant as, the, as my Lord sees, but there's always a but when everything is looking pleasant. The water is bad and the ground barren. Have you ever been in a situation where you look good on the outside? You smell good. You look good. You got all the stuff on, on top of you. It looks really good. But on the inside, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on that's having a stench, that's bitter, that's barren, you know, that's hopeless, that's, you know, tasteless, it's useless, it's worthless. And, and you, you, you have to cover up all that with a facade. We got to give that lovely smile and say, how you do? Nice to see you. But on the inside, we are broken. On the inside, we want, we want, to, we want to break down and cry, but we have to put up that image. We, gotta, we have to have our image set up so we, we walk out with, with, with the best dress on and, and we look good, we smell good, you know, and, and, and we, we, we wear that lovely smile that flashes in us. It just comes out. It just comes to you like that. But inside, there's a, there's a brokenness. In, it looks pleasant on the outside. Yeah, yeah, it's a 3,500 rupees dress. Looks good. Shoes look good. German wear. Looks good. Branded items. All branded, all branded, all branded. Looking really good, pleasant, but something is on the inside that is eating you away. But God sent me to tell you, no matter how it looks good on the outside, God wants to do a work on the inside because he's not impressed by the exterior. He's more impressed by the interior. For what is inside is eternal than what is outside. And so the Bible says in verse 20, and he said, bring me a new bowl and put salt into it. And so they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast it, cast in the salt and said, thus says the Lord. See, Elisha was not claiming the glory. Elisha didn't say I did it or the salt did it. He says, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From it there shall be no more death or barrenness so the water remains healed to this day according to the word of Elisha which he spoke which was the word of the Lord listen here is an unchangeable situation we don't know for how many years that city of Jericho was pleasant to look at but not pleasant to live in it looked good but it had bad water and it had barrenness nothing could grow even if it tries to grow, it rots. Why? The water was bad. Isn't it an oxymoron that you have got both the good and the bad at the same time? Isn't it an oxymoron to find at the gate beautiful a man who is ugly, lame from his mother's birth, but he's at the gate beautiful? Have you ever seen the ugly and the beautiful meet at the same place? In the Bible, you will do. In the Bible, is the only place you will see the ugly meet at the beautiful. In the Bible, it's the only place you will see the weak meet the strong. In the Bible, it's the only place you will see the kid meet the king. In the Bible, it's the only place where you'll see a person who has never been a warrior, who's a worshiper, who will meet a warrior like, like Goliath and have a fight. It's only in the Bible. It's only in the Bible. It was an unchangeable situation. No matter what technology they used, they couldn't change the water. They used water purifiers. They, they used the mosses. They, they, they used all the kind of things. They got aqua to come in. They got, you know, Kevin, Kentucky, whatever you call it now. All the leading, you know, reverse osmosis plants were brought in. And they tried with all the technological advancement and scientific advancement. They tried to purify the water, but they couldn't. But one man of God under the anointing of God. One man that had been a consecrated, sold out, pure, carrying the power of God. One man stepped in through the soul. And what was not healed by science, what could not be healed by technology, what could not be restored by human intelligence. The Bible says the power of God changed the unchangeable. What is in your life that is yet to be changed? 
unchangeable. It looks bad. It looks dangerous. It looks hopeless. But I came to tell you today, all is not lost. Your God has the power to change the unchangeable. Give that unchangeable sickness to God. Give that unchangeable situation to God. Give that unchangeable problem to God. Today, His power is available to change the unchangeable. Let's rise to our feet. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise and thank you for the word today. Thank you, Lord, for the demonstration of your power and your spirit. Thank you for what you said. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for your glory that was poured upon this house. Thank you. Thank you for the anointing, O oh God. And I pray, Father, that as we receive this word, may we not walk away as doers, as hearers, but as doers of this word, Lord. May we just not be happy with, with the content, but make, may we, Lord, take the content and turn it, Lord, with intent to become the concept of our life. May content become our lifestyle. In the name of Jesus, we set our minds to applying the word to our lives daily. Father, we commit ourselves to daily consecration today. We commit ourselves to daily consecration today. Thank you, Father. I pray for those who have come here, Lord, with impossible, Lord, situations in their lives. Red seas that are, Lord, standing before them and saying, I dare you to try to get across. I dare you. But thank you, Lord. You said, lift your rod, stretch your hand, and divide it. In the name of Jesus, I divide every Red Sea situation in the lives of your children right now in Jesus' name. I divide it, Lord. May your children pass on dry ground. May they pass through on dry ground. I, I pray for miracles all over this building, all over this building. In every life, in every life, in every family, in every situation right now. Lord, let the impossible become possible. Let them pass through it, Lord. And like Joshua, Father, we thank you. As priests, we are carrying the ark of your presence. And because we carry your presence, we carry your purity. And because we carry your purity, we carry your power. And Lord, we are willing to stand firm even in the middle of every, Lord, attack of the enemy. We stand firm because we know, Lord, that we are destined to go to the other side. We will walk through wet stuff with dry feet. Bless your people that came here today. Perform miracles in their life. Giving you all the glory, honor, and praise. We offer this prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. 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 Let's sing this song once we can dismiss. Are you blessed? Amen. Were you blessed? Amen. You are blessed. Stay blessed and pass on the blessing quickly. We will run through a couple of stances and then you can be on your way.